What we're going to do now is we're going to start describing Java streams. You've seen little bits and pieces of Java streams in some of the earlier discussions, but this is the first time we'll really go through them in a very thorough and systematic way. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to talk about what's the structure and functionality of a Java 8 stream. And you'll learn that they kind of have a common look and feel, if you will. Uh, I'll talk about sort of the fundamentals of streams. We'll talk about things called aggregate operations, which are these so-called higher order functions, which sounds intimidating, but it's really just a function that takes a function. Uh, and I'll use a, a simple example program to illustrate the concepts. This is a program that's going to take a bunch of names of characters from Shakespeare's Hamlet. I'm a big Shakespeare fan, so I always use Shakespeare examples. And it's going to take the Shakespeare character names. It's going to get rid of everybody who doesn't start with either an uppercase or lowercase h. That'll be like Horatio and Hamlet and so on. Then we're going to capitalize them all in a consistent way. We're going to sort them, and then we're going to print out the results. So just a simple thing, just so I can say something uh, more meaningful than abstract discussions about abstruse topics and concepts. This example you can get in my EX12 folder from my GitHub account. All right, so Java streams are a framework that was added in Java 8 in March of 2014. And they basically make it possible to apply functional programming features in a compositional way. That doesn't explain very much, but I'll give you lots of examples. Uh, and there's a couple of key benefits that streams provide to programs. One of the key things that they do is they allow you to manipulate flows of data that will be passed through a pipeline of aggregate operations in a stream where the aggregate operations in the stream are essentially composed functions. So remember when we talked about what is functional programming, I said one of the things you can do in functional programming is compose a bunch of functions together where the input of one function is the output of the, another and so on, and you sort of put them together in a pipeline or a bucket brigade-like fashion. So that's basically what a stream allows us to be able to do. That's part of it. The other thing, of course, it does, because these are functional, it allows us to focus on what operations to perform rather than how to perform them. Now, obviously, there is a bunch of how here. It's not all about what, but the how is typically implemented and hidden behind other stuff. What you can do with this is you can enable transparent parallelization without the need to write any multi-threading code. So this class isn't really talking about multi-threading in the first place, but if it were to have done so, or if you were to take the sister class that we'll teach in the spring, the sibling class we'll talk about in the spring, you'd learn all about threading. And one of the things that's cool about parallel streams, as we'll see in assignment number three, is you can get this giant speed up without having to write any threads at all. So it's pretty cool. It, it handles those things in a magic way. And what happens in this, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, is the data elements that are flowing through the aggregate operations that make up the stream pipeline are automatically going to be mapped to the processor cores. And it does this in a really cool way, which we'll talk about probably in a couple weeks. There's an excellent tutorial available here in the Oracle website that explains a lot of this stuff. Obviously, we will go into this stuff in a lot more detail than is covered in the tutorial. So what is a stream? A stream is basically a pipeline of so-called aggregate operations that process a sequence of elements. And sometimes we call those elements values or data or objects. Don't like to use the word object there, although oftentimes they are objects. But a best way to think about it are like a flow of data through a pipeline of conjoined aggregate operations. So what is an aggregate operation? Well, it's essentially a higher order function that applies a behavior parameter to every element in a stream. So what is a higher order function? It's just a fancy schmancy sort of ethereal sounding term that says it's a function that takes a function. So these aggregate operations are functions, and they're past behaviors which are functions, although more specifically, they are typically lambda expressions or method references. But under the hood, they're methods or functions. So you have functions taking functions. That makes them higher order functions. 
a stream conceptually is unbounded. In other words, it'll just be like a flow of elements, a flow of data that in theory could go on forever. Uh, obviously, in practice, it doesn't go on forever because your, your program has to stop. And it's usually bounded by practical constraints, like how many images could you find to download and process? Or sometimes it's even more specific. How much input did the user type in? So in theory, it could be unbounded, but in practice, it's typically bounded. Although you'll see as we talk a little bit later about some of the operations used to create streams, there are, in fact, operations to create infinite length streams, such as generate or iterate. Many other streams are created from fixed size things like arrays or collections of some kind. Here's an example of some aggregate operations. So uh, of, filter, map, sorted, for each. Those are all examples of aggregate operations. Everything I have colored here in red is an aggregate operation. A stream is typically created by some kind of factory. So there's typically a source of a stream. Uh, in this particular case, the stream source is going to be the of method, which is a factory method. And what it's doing in this particular case is it's taking an array of strings, Horatio, Laertes, and Hamlet, and so on, and it's converting it into a stream of strings. So of, which is described here in this link, is a factory method that converts an array of something into a stream of something, an array of type T into a stream of type T. Of is actually quite interesting. I, we won't talk a lot more about of, but I just want to give you a little sense of why it's cool. You can use of on a whole bunch of things, and you can also use of in conjunction with some other aggregate operations to do very interesting things. So here's an example where we might have three lists of strings, L1, L2, and L3, and we might say, stream.of l1, l2, l3, what that does is that creates a stream of three lists of strings, right? So now we have three lists of strings in a stream. And then we can call another aggregate operation, which is called flat map. Flat map is a very interesting aggregate operation, which we'll talk about at length later. And what it does is it converts the list of strings into, sorry, it converts the stream of lists of strings into a stream of strings. So it goes ahead and it flattens out all the elements. So instead of having th you know, three lists of strings, we just have a stream of strings. So flat map is used to flatten things out. We'll talk a lot more about that. You'll get a chance to play around with flat map later in the course. There's a whole bunch of different ways to make streams. The ones I've colored here in red are ones that will spend a bit of time on. We'll also talk about some of these other ones as well. But the point of this is there's lots and lots of different ways to make something into a stream. An aggregate operation, which is this function, this higher order function, performs a behavior on each of the elements in a stream. So the behavior itself, which is this parameter to the aggregate operation, is typically implemented by a lambda expression or a method reference of some kind. Here's a simple example. So here is the capitalize method reference, which is just a reference to the capitalized method. We'll look at it in a second. And it's passed, as you can see, as the behavior to the map aggregate operation. So capitalize is a method reference. You'll see, of course, up here, this is passing in a, a lambda expression, not a method reference. This is passing in a method reference. This particular aggregate operation takes no parameters whatsoever. It just takes whatever is in the stream and sorts them, and so on and so forth. Ideally, the output of a behavior, right? So if we've got you know, capitalize or whatever, the output of a behavior should only depend on its input arguments and should have no side effects. So ideally, this is not always the case. But ideally, we don't want to have side effects. The reason we don't have side effects is because side effects lead to all kinds of bad issues. Number one, in a parallel program, you can have race conditions and other concurrency hazards. More generally, it's just harder to reason about code if you have side effects, which is not to say you should never have them. It just you should try not to have them. And indeed, if you look at capitalize, which was that method reference we passed here to map, you can see it takes a string. If the string is zero length, it just returns the string. Otherwise, it goes ahead and figures out 
how to capitalize the first character and lowercase everything else. But you'll see it has no side effects other than returning a result that modified the input parameter in some way. The input parameter is not changed, of course, because strings are immutable, but the output has a new result. As I said before, behaviors with side effects will likely cause trouble. So it'll incur race conditions where your program will behave differently depending on how you run it. And so as a result, you want to be careful to avoid side effects unless you really know what you're doing. Not that you can't do that, you just have to really know what you're doing. The other thing to remember is only you can prevent race conditions, just like only you can prevent forest fires, right? Uh, and so the compiler, the Java virtual machine will not save you. If you have code that has bugs, the compiler will say, okay, boss, you told me what to do. I just sort of carry it out blindly. It's not my fault if you screw things up. Streams are cool. You know, why, why do we care about them? Because they allow us to be able to build these pipelines where we can chain things together in very flexible ways. So the idea here is you can write sort of reusable behaviors and then you can chain them together in a pipeline using the aggregate operations to decide what they do and, and what order they run in. So this is just the classic kind of pipes and filters architecture that's been around forever. If anybody here is familiar with command line shells like bash or TC shell or C shell or born shell, there's a whole bunch of shells that are out there, especially for Unix programmers. Those are examples of pipelines. You can pipe things together. You can have the little uh, vertical bar. You can take the output of one utility and transform it as the input to the next utility in the pipeline. And a stream is much the same kind of idea. So here's a more detailed visualization on the left-hand side of what's actually going on on the right-hand side. So what we're going to have here is we have an array of strings, which is basically a, a list of names. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we then go ahead and run those list of names through of. Of creates a stream of names, a stream of names, which are strings. We then go ahead and filter things out. So we're going to end up with a stream of strings or names that start with the letter H, uppercase or lowercase. We then run that through map, which is the aggregate operation that takes the capitalized behavior. And you can see we end up with a stream of capitalized names. Then we run that through sorted, and now we have a stream of sorted names that begin with H, right? So each of the things here does some kind of filtering or transformation or transmogrification or whatever you want to say to the flow of data that's going through the stream. So each aggregate operation can filter and or transform the stream based on the behavior that's passed into it. Any questions about that? A couple things to remember. First, streams do not contain non-transient storage. I think I said that right. Um, in other words, the data that flows through a stream is just stored in memory. If, for some reason, your program were to crash, then anything that was in the stream would be lost. So if, you, if that's not desirable, you'd have to find some other way to persist the information that you're working on. In practice, that's not really a big deal, but I'm just mentioning it. So it's kind of like a, like a sand castle at the beach, right? You can build this wonderful structure, and then waves come along and wash it down. So it's, it's going to be transient. Every stream works in a very similar way. So the good news is that once you've mastered the art of streams programming, all your programs look kind of alike. And that's also a huge win, right? The consistency of syntax, the consistency of semantics is very reassuring because it allows you to think more consistently about what you're doing. So what you do is you always start with a source of data, right? So like you have a source of names. In this case, we have an array. You could also have a list or a collection. So you could say, you know, let's make a list of strings we call characters, which are the characters from the, the play uh, Shakespeare. And then we can say characters.stream. So that's a different way to do things. This way, the previous way we used of. Now we make a list and we say stream. Just two different ways of doing that. And there's other ways to do it too. We have generator functions, input channels, and so on and so forth. The next thing we do is we process the data, right? We've got ourselves this stream of names. We process the data through a pipeline of intermediate operations that each map an input stream to an output stream. So you can see we take the 
stream of names. We filter out ones that don't start with H. We capitalize the ones that do start with H, and then we sort them. And these operations here, filter, map, sorted, are examples of so-called intermediate operations. And as you'll see, they're the things that sit between the input source and the terminal operation, which I'll talk about in a second. Common example intermediate operations that you'll use over and over and over again are map, filter, and flat map. There are other ones too, but those are the ones that are most common. And the last thing you always have in a stream, and you only ever have one of these, and it's got to be there, otherwise nothing works, is something that's called a terminal operation. And that's simply an aggregate operation that yields a non-stream result. So you'll see here we've filtered, mapped, and sorted. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to terminate the stream with something that's going to print each element out to the standard output. The terminal operation does a couple of things. The first thing it does is it triggers all the intermediate operations, which don't even start to run until the terminal operation is reached. So these operations here, it may appear as if they're doing something, but they don't do anything until the last operation in the stream is reached. And later, when we talk more about how streams work under the hood, I'll explain how that works, and you'll know why it works that way. It's pretty cool. Because that's one thing. They trigger the intermediate operations, and they also typically have some kind of side effect, either printing something out or reducing all the data in the stream to a single result, which could be a collection or a single primitive value. There can be only one terminal operation. So you have, to, you have to have it, and there can only be one. So just remember that. You, you may, my, my mistake when I first started programming was, was to forget to have terminal operations. And uh, I found that very frustrating, because my, my programs wouldn't do anything. And I said, ah, yes, I've got to have a terminal operation. So you may run across that bug in your code. By default, each aggregate operation in a stream runs its behavior sequentially. And uh, what that means is it runs in a single thread of control. And it's the thread of control whoever calls the terminal operation. So whatever thread is what calls the terminal operation is the thread where the processing in the stream takes place. And by default, that is almost always the main thread. So unless you spawn a thread and have a stream in that spawn thread, usually it'll be running in the main thread of control. So by default, it's usually the main thread. And that's what we're going to focus on first. And the reason why we do that is, A, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on because there's only one thread. And also, it turns out, one of the great things about streams is if you follow a few simple rules, like only have stateless behaviors, then you can go from sequential to parallel with a very minor, minuscule change, namely changing how you create the stream from a sequential stream to a parallel stream. And then everything else magically works. So that's why we start out with sequential streams first. Where we're headed, of course, because that's the purpose of the class, is to focus on parallel streams. And unlike sequential streams, where everything runs in a single thread, in parallel streams, there will be multiple threads used to process the input from the data source in parallel. And what's so cool about this, and which I think you'll develop a great appreciation for as we get further along in the class, is that under the hood, the common fork join pool that we've talked about already is what's used to execute the behaviors that are running in the threads within the stream. And so all the stuff that we've talked about with respect to the common fork join pool, all the experience you're about to get by programming the common fork join pool, all that stuff will pay off because when we get to parallel streams, that's what's used under the hood to run everything. But the good news is, as you will discover firsthand, is that it's a heck of a lot easier to program parallel computing by using the functional programming facade provided by the streams framework than it is to try to program using the fork join pool directly. Fork join pool is not that hard to program, but it's tedious and error prone. And if you didn't have to do it, you'd prefer not to. So what streams does is it hides all the fork join pool stuff behind this wonderful functional programming facade that allows you to compose these aggregate operations together with their behaviors. OK, so that is the end of part one of this particular section.